church family. Good morning. Good morning. I do a few announcements as we get started this morning. First off, a reminder to council members that there's a council meeting after worship today. Please come to the meeting. Uh, second, I have the results from our pierogi sale that concluded this week. We got the pierogies picked up on Thursday, so we now have our final results. We sold 131 bags of a dozen pierogies, and the church's profit on that was $305.75. So thanks to everyone who sold pierogies to their family and friends and co-workers, our top seller who won the prize for most pierogies sold was Tara, and our second place top seller was Birdie. So congratulations to both Tara and Birdie for your excellent pierogi selling skills. Uh, and no worries, the fact that we did a pierogi order sale does not mean that our hoagie and pretzel sandwich uh, fundraiser has disappeared. The hoagie and pretzel sandwich fundraiser will be coming back again soon. Do not fear. Uh, all right, a couple of things coming up. Reminder that Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday, the 22nd. We will have worship at 7 p.m. on Ash Wednesday for anyone who would like to attend. Anyone who wishes will be able to receive ashes during that service. And we will also celebrate communion during the service as we begin the season of Lent on Wednesday, this Wednesday at 7 p.m. We will also this year be having another uh, Wednesday afternoon Lenten Bible study, much like last year. Last year's study we uh, had based on a book that folks were reading throughout the study. This year is working a little bit differently. Our study is inspired by the hymn Amazing Grace, which celebrates its 250th anniversary this year. So. Each one of our sessions, which will be at 1 p.m. every Wednesday during Lent, starting on March 1st, there's a flyer on the, bullet, on the lighted bulletin board with all of those dates. Uh, we'll have a packet that we're going to discuss during the, during the session with some lyrics from the hymns and some, with some lyrics from the hymn and some scripture quotes that are inspired by that. Copies of this are out on the counter in the narthex. Anyone who thinks they're going to attend on Wednesday, March 1st for session one is welcome to take one. If we run out and I need to print off more, just come see me, let me know. And anyone who has any questions about our Lenten Bible study, also feel free to see me and I will answer them for you. It'll be Wednesdays, 1 p.m., starting March 1st, every Wednesday in Lent. Right. Ah, and one final uh, announcement I almost forgot. Flower orders are being taken starting this morning after worship. The order, yes, Ms. Bart. No, I'm taking. Thank you. Today. Okay. Oh. Ms. Marge will be taking flower orders for us. Uh, in the parlor after worship this morning. The order forms are out there next to the uh, bulletin table. Uh, and Ms. Marge can help you out with any questions about that. Thank you, Ms. Marge. We will also be taking them for the next two weeks after this week through March 5th. All right, and I think those are finally all of this morning's announcements. I know we had a few this morning. Any other news or announcements the, from the community this morning. Anything that I missed? Yes. Prayer shawl on Tuesday. Ah, yes, thank you. Prayer shawl meeting on Tuesday for anyone who would like to join the group. 1 p.m.? All right, prayer shawl on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Any other news or announcements 
from the community. All right, then we will let the chimes bring us into worship. together in this morning's call to worship. We have followed Christ to the mountaintop. We have seen Christ changed before us, face shining like the sun. We have heard Christ's purpose proclaimed by God. Now let us come down with Christ from the mountain. And we worship together through song with our opening hymn. We'll sing the first two verses of number 419. Forgive us 
for wanting to dwell in your presence without being transformed with new energy for the work of your ministry. We take also a moment now for the confessions within our own hearts in the silence. When we want to uh, linger above rather than return to level ground, Jesus gently encourages us in the right direction. And so we proclaim. Council member for a new term. 
Bertie McCary has been moved by the Holy Spirit in accordance with the faith and order of this church to serve among you as a council member. She has accepted her call and is with us in willingness to serve. And so I now invite Bertie to come forward and affirm the covenant she is entering into with you, standing before the gathered community. Sister in Christ, it is an honor to be entrusted with the responsibility of being a council member brings. Having prayerfully considered the duties of your ministry, are you prepared to undertake this position with the help of God and for the glory of God? If so, please answer, I am. I am. And do you promise to exercise this ministry diligently and faithfully, showing forth the love of Christ? If so, please answer, I do with the help of God. I do with the help of God. You may turn and face the congregation. I now present to this community of faith your newly installed council member. Let all who are able please stand and we will pray together for her. The prayer is found at the top of page three in your bulletins. Pray with me, church family. Eternal God, you have called this person to serve this household of faith, which you have entrusted to our care. Send your Holy Spirit on her so she may serve among us with an honor and faithfulness. Help her be diligent in her duties, that this, your church, may prosper in the mission you place before it. Amen. Thank you. The congregation may be seated, and our new council member can also return to her seat. That was the fun part. Now she has to come and do work at the council meeting after worship. Friends, let's pray as we prepare to read our scriptures. Living light, it is only through your brightness that we see what is truly prophetic. It is only through your warmth that we envelop the globe with what is truly love. And so it is your glow that we ask to penetrate all the dark places in ourselves and in our world as we read from your story. And the people say, Amen. Instead of reading from a Hebrew scripture and then a gospel, this week, we're going to start with the Gospel and then read from one of the epistles because both passages reference the same event. Our first reading is Matthew's version of the Transfiguration story, which comes following Jesus' prediction of his impending arrest and death. We read from chapter 17, beginning at the first verse. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became bright as light. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will set up three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, uh, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, 
This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they raised their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Here ends the first reading. Our second reading comes from the second letter of Peter. In defending the power and identity of Jesus, the author refers to the transfiguration as confirmation of Christ's divine glory and reminds their readers that this is a message they should pay attention to. We read from chapter 1, beginning at verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Here ends today's readings. May they be a lamp for our feet to grab a mini cube, a mini Rubik's cube, on your way into worship this morning. Excellent. I know we ran out. I'm sorry about that, although I'm excited that there are more folks here than I planned for. That's a good thing. I trust that you folks can divvy them up so that there's one to each household <laughs> that wants one. You guys know how to share. So for those of you who managed to uh, get your hands on one of our little cubes, how many of you have been playing with it already this morning? Mm -hmm. How many of you uh, think you're pretty good at a Rubik's Cube? Okay, all right, a couple of uh, people who seem like they might. Anyone figure theirs out? Anyone get theirs back? Oh, we got one! Very good, Miss Rachel. You got it all back to your colors. All right. Well, I was feeling pretty clever when I was going to show you mine. I know it's hard to, they are a little small. These are budget cubes. But <laughs> you mine. I think mine and Rachel's might match. Anyone other than Rachel think that they could get their cube back to this state? Couple. All right, someone thinks they might be about uh, close to it. it. Takes a lot of work, doesn't it? Confession time. I didn't get this Rubik's Cube to this place. They came like this from our friendly Amazon delivery person, and I had fun scrambling all yours up, so you got to play with them. I kept mine for myself. A little early uh, April Fool's joke, I guess. Here's a question, though. How is a Rubik's Cube like the Transfiguration? It's hard to figure out. 
Hard to figure out. That's a good one. I like that, Miss Marge. Anything else? Brings order out of chaos. Brings order out of chaos? I like you guys are coming up with some really fancy answers here. You can shout them out too if you think you have an idea. Once it's scrambled, it'll never look the same again. I like that. Once it's scrambled, it'll never look the same again. Maybe. Maybe some of us can get it to look the same again, but it's certainly hard. What do you do with a Rubik's Cube, ideally? You transform it. Another word for transfiguration is to transform. Jesus is transformed on the mountain, just like all of you have spent half the morning trying to transform your cubes back to the way mine looks. There's one other way that I think our Rubik's Cubes can remind us of the transfiguration. But that's something I want you to keep thinking about as we go into our sermon. And if you listen, I'll give you my answer. And by the way, you may uh, keep your Rubik's Cubes as a reminder of our transfiguration, trans formation story. Ah. But for now, let us sing. What are we going to sing? I don't remember. Ah, we're going to sing uh, number 183. This is one of those real short things, so we are going to sing it twice through. In this stand as we're able to... Transfiguration, 
with Jesus' face shining like the sun and his clothes shining as bright as light. Now it is Peter, James, and John who have made the journey up the mountain because their hearts are fixed on following Jesus. They've already found the teacher and the Messiah that they expected him. But here on the mountain, with this scene of light, they now get so much more than they are able to understand at the time. That's the other thread running through the Epiphany season. The capstone stories of the star and the transfiguration give us the image of Jesus as the light of the world. But each one of the stories in Epiphany are about introducing us to him. In each one, Jesus shows a little bit of who he is to the crowds, to the disciples, giving them a taste of something that they long for, but don't truly understand. Weeks ago, the crowds on the shores of the, Jer the Jordan heard the same thundering voice that the disciples did this morning, declaring Jesus the beloved Son, with whom God is well pleased. The disciples had their moments of call, away from John the Baptist, or away from their fishing boats. The crowds got to hear blessings that didn't sound like blessings, and the encouragement that they were salt, which was also a challenge to be flavorful during the Sermon on the Mount. In all of these, stories, they were getting a sense of who Jesus is and what his mission is, what his message is. Epiphany is filled with discovery and energy and hope, all things we associate with light. People in our Epiphany season, however, from the Magi to the crowds to the disciples, don't know what's coming next. They're excited at these initial ideas of Jesus, but they don't know about the sacrifice coming down the road. They don't know about the cross. They don't understand what it means for the kingdom of heaven to be at hand. They get what it means to have a prophet among them. That's part of their history. And they're even prepared for the possibility of the Messiah. But they have no concept of God made flesh and no preparation for what Messiah truly means. Epiphany is all about beginnings, about the start of the journey for Jesus and for the people around him, for the church and for us. Which is why the Transfiguration story is such an appropriate one with which to close this season. The Transfiguration is by far the most dramatic reveal of Jesus so far. Instead of a star's light, Jesus himself is now transformed by light, his inner brightness 
shining outwardly on his face and clothes. This time there are two of Israel's greatest ancestors, Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus even before the thunderous voice from heaven sounds its peace. It is the gospel's boldest statement so far that Jesus is not only a teacher or a prophet, not even only the Messiah, but filled with God's own self, God's own glory in a way that has never been seen before. No wonder the disciples want to bask in this moment on the mountain. No wonder they bow themselves to the ground in reverent fear. This is something wholly different, something unexpected, and it is being revealed to them this isn't merely a snapshot, but a portrait of where their journey will end up taking them. It's an in-depth sneak peek of Jesus' glory, of the church's future promises made real ahead of time. It is proof of all that they will come to believe through what happens next. But it's still the beginning of the journey. The disciples are getting a sneak peek at all that is to come, getting to see the glory of Jesus behind the curtain of ordinary human flesh. They and everyone else back down on the ground still have a long way to go before they really understand what that means. This one special look on the mountaintop, no matter how much it reveals, isn't enough to make them see the whole picture. They still need to walk the journey that's coming. Jesus still needs to sacrifice before Easter can dawn. The disciples still need to doubt all that they've begun to hope for before they can realize their wildest dreams come to life. That's why the transfiguration story needs to end with silence, at least for now. Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. That's what Jesus says to the disciples as they head down the mountain to meet up with the rest of their group. You've been given a behind-the-scenes look at my glory. You've been shown proof that I am not only human, but also divine. You've been granted a glimpse of where we are all going. But that doesn't mean you get to skip the work of getting there. That doesn't mean that you can instantly explain who I am to everyone around you. That doesn't mean you understand everything now. So you need to hold this moment close to your chest until we've all seen this journey through. The wonder of the transfiguration 
this miracle of light and insight is meant to coerce the doubtful into believing. It is meant to be a stunning show and tell. It is meant to carry with you down from the mountain and held in your heart through all the hardest moments. It is meant to be a comfort for you who are already trying to believe, a reassurance for when the way seems long. Don't tell anyone yet, Jesus says. Just take it with you so you'll have it when you need it. It's kind of like having a completed Rubik's Cube to look at while you're still trying to figure out the wand in your hands. Proof that it can be done, a promise to hold on to, but not something that will let you skip the work of figuring out the puzzle. That's the transfiguration. That's also the answer I promised you a few minutes ago. Decades down the line, the author of Second Peter has realized this purpose of the transfiguration. The Son of Man has long since been raised from the dead. The vision of the mountain, the vision on the mountain has clearly been shared among the community. And now the author is reminding us why. Why it couldn't be shared when they first came down the mountain and why it's so important to keep sharing it throughout the church now. The testimony of the Transfiguration is a way for the church community to hear Christ's glory more fully confirmed, the author writes, something for the church to hold on to as, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Take the vision with you like a lamp shining in the darkness. Take this wonder with you until the journey is complete and the morning star rises in your heart. Transfiguration story has been spread much further and wider than it had when the author of Second Peter wrote those words, reminding the people to carry it with them. It is being read in thousands of sanctuaries across the world today. All across the world, churches are preparing to enter the Lenten season this Wednesday on the heels of this story. This wonder-filled moment on the mountaintop, this peek into Christ's full glory and all the promises that are held within it, is what we carry out of our season of light and into our season of Lent. It is the lamp lighting our journey to the cross, just the same as for those three disciples who first saw the vision. When the road seems long, take this glimpse of Christ's glory with you. 
when the puzzle of faith feels like something you will never be able to solve, carry this picture of the finished product in your spirit's pocket. When the way ahead is dark, when chaos lurks around the corner, when even tomorrow is too far ahead to grasp, hold on to this vision of Christ's light. Let it be the lamp that shines along every step of your journey until the unending day of Christ's love dawns and the morning star rises in every heart. Amen. Friends, as we uh, prepare to pray together, are there any uh, joyous concerns, prayer requests to share with the community this morning? that they get the healing and the answers that they need. Any other joys, concerns, prayer requests to share with the community this morning? Yes, Bertie? wonderful second prize. We share in Bertie's joy at her wonderful prize. And Who knows what delicacies will be cooked up. And I must say, all my closest neighbors were thrilled that I brought them home their dinner for that night. Everyone that I know that I sold Bertie to, we all had Bertie's Thursday night. <laughs> we share in the joy of good food that lends to the good work of our church. Thank you, Bertie. Any other joys, concerns, prayer requests to share with the community this morning? This morning, I share with you a prayer written for Transfiguration Sunday by a pastor of the Uniting Church in Australia, who has given permission for it to be used by others in worship which I have very lightly adapted. Let's pray, church family. Oh God, we open our eyes and we see Jesus. The months of ministry transfigured to a beam of light, the light of the world, your light. May your light shine upon us. We open our eyes and we see Moses and Elijah, your word restoring us, showing us the way, telling a story, your story, Christ's story, our story. May your word speak to us. We open our eyes and we see mist cloud of your presence, which assures us of all we do not know and that we do not need to fear. Teach us to trust. We open our eyes and we see Peter's constructions, his best plans, our best plans, our missing the point, our missing the way. Forgive our foolishness. We open our eyes and we see Jesus, 
not casting us off, but leading us down, leading us out to the work, to the walk, to the people. Your love endures forever. And at long last, we open to our ears and we hear your voice. This is my beloved son, listen to him. And we give you thanks. We give you thanks that rings in our voices as we raise them together in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven,
to be bearers of God's presence back on the plain places. Bringing life and Christ's love wherever we go. And go out into the world, be strong and of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, love and serve the Savior, and may the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer go with you and be with you.